But we're going to jump in a little bit about humans of customer success. How many of us are here for the first time? Just like a show of hands. Nice. Mike, Jared, Justin. Awesome. Good to see you guys. Welcome. So our goal with humans of customer success is really just to connect, support, and amplify the voices of those of us in customer success. We do that mostly through our monthly, oh, sometimes it's monthly, sometimes it's every other month. It's a lot of volunteer-led and koala-led. Um, but we do that uh, mostly through our community meetings. Uh, we also have resources available for everyone. We have an online forum. Uh, we have uh, leader interviews on YouTube and a lot more. So please get involved um, as you see fit. The community, as mentioned, uh, is supported by Koala IO. We are an all-in-one platform for customer success teams. We'll share a little bit more about that later. And today's topic, lessons from customer success leaders, critical lessons. So for us, um, we have here a fantastic group of battle-tested customer success leaders that are newish to their current role, meaning they've been at their current company um, for 12 months or less. Um, and we thought this being November, it's towards the end of the year, it's a great way to reflect um, on everything that we've accomplished and learned over 2020 thus far. So. Let's get started with introductions. We have Nadia Collins, who is the Chief Customer Officer at ThankView. I know we have several Thank viewers on the call today. Wave, hello. I see Kevin, I know you're on my, my first page. Uh, and then we have uh, Todd Ilberg, who's the VP of Customer Success at Stencil. Hey, Todd. Um, we also have Justin Beery, who's the Head of Customer Success at Cardiologs. Hello. Okay, cool. So um, let's kick it off. Todd, if you could please share 30 seconds, a little bit about yourself, about Stencil. Feel free to tell us where you're zooming in from today. Go ahead. Sure. Hey, everyone. Uh, Todd Ilberg, uh, as Sansi said, uh, VP of Customer Success, but also known as Promise Keeping. Um, <laughs> zooming in from White Plains, New York. Uh, but I, I lead the customer success practice at Stencil, and we're an agile content creation platform supporting uh, marketers, uh, specifically in email. And uh, it's great to be here today with you all. Awesome. Hey, thanks for being with us. Love that you're a part of this call today. It's your first time leading or being part of the panelists as well as Justin and Nadia. So that's amazing. Justin, how about you? Why don't you intro yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, Justin Vary, uh, Head of Client Services at uh, Cardiologs. Uh, Cardiologs is a, a AI SaaS platform for cardiac diagnostics. So mainly used by cardiologists or technicians of cardiologists to analyze uh, heart rhythm. Uh, I'm zooming in from, uh, from the Boston area. Uh, we decided to do a really interesting and smart thing and buy a house during the lockdown. So I am uh, coming straight to you from my new basement office, which I, which I love. So excited to be here. Congrats on that. Thanks for, thanks for being here, Justin. Nadia, last but certainly not least. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah, so Nadia Collins, Chief Customer Officer at ThankView. ThankView is a video outreach platform uh, focused on stewardship uh, and our customers is at primarily in the education and nonprofit space. Um, so a little bit about me. I was born in the Netherlands um, and then I studied actually in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, and then since then I lived in London, um, LA, Boston, and then now I am zooming out of New York City. Nice to see everyone. Nice, welcome. Awesome. Um, I got so distracted by looking at the other Zoom pages. Vishnu, Marcus, Jackie, it's so good to see everyone, Chaz. Okay, focus, Sincere. Uh, so I'm Sansi, I'm co-founder here at Koala IO. We are a new way to build customer health scores, operationalize workflows, and manage team productivity right from one workspace, all for customer success teams. So it's a pleasure to be here today. Let us jump right in. Um, I'm going to tee up the first few questions, and I'm guessing that uh, we'll have a lot of chats from everyone here today around additional questions uh, or advice that you'd like to add around the topic. So no matter how many years that you have in customer success, our field is relatively new. It still has that new, wild, and exciting vibe to it. 
most of us say it's been around for about 10 ish years. So I do love to ask leaders what's one of the most surprising things they've learned while building or revamping their customer success teams or even being a CSM, a practitioner. Uh, so let me go ahead and kick it to you, Justin. What's something that you've learned recently or at your last several months at Cardiologs? How has that new knowledge altered or updated your approach to customer success? Um, yeah, I would say, I, I would say I, uh, I'll pat myself on the back with this comment, but it, it, uh, it really strengthened my, um, my non-committal approach to a lot of things. Like I have, I have a series of uh, kind of ideals or pillars of customer success that I've always kept in my mind. But when faced at, with different company at different companies with different issues, I try my hardest to not apply that like blanket logic to a, a solution, even though it looks and smells like the same one from a previous role. Uh, and I that that kind of it depends answer has has kind of rung true in my first you know year. Uh, or so at at Cardiologs. So uh, I'm blessed to uh, have been with Cardiologs and, and have them give me the op opportunity to kind of fail a little bit uh, and and not just attack uh, and like attack things with kind of some some um, interest and curiosity and, and take different approaches to things. Uh, and so that's been that's been just like really interesting to see that evolve and and see how like my answer at one company to a very similar issue is a complete 180 to my answer here at Cardiologs for a, you know a, a similar issue. I love that. I think something I've learned from you, Justin, is that number one, you have your phrase "always be gauging," and <laughs> which I've I've actually put in some of our Koala onboarding materials. And then the other thing is you like to answer a lot of questions with, it depends, which can be so frustrating, but so true. And then you sort of go through why it depends. So I love that. I appreciate that. Um, let's, let's kick it over to you, Todd. Something that, that, you've, that you've learned that's maybe changed or updated your approach to CS. Yeah, no, thanks for uh, the question and, and great to be here again. Um, for me, just to set the background, I've been at Stencil uh, just about seven and a half months, started just as the pandemic got underway. So I haven't actually been in our office or met any of my team members or peers in person. And so I would say that, you know, the, the thing that is, is top of mind as I, I reflect back on the last seven months is I've spent a lot of time making sure that I'm building those really, really strong relationships internally, as well as with the customers, because it's hard to get anything done in customer success without bringing along people for the, the journey, right? If you come in as an outsider with your playbooks, and your recipe cards and you're saying, hey, here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna get people that are gonna jump on board with you and you're gonna be people that are like, ah, I don't know if I'm on board with this. I don't know who this person is. And so for me, the, the last seven months have been establishing the foundation, but really focusing on earning you know, a lot of trust and being genuine and authentic in the role that I'm playing and what, what, what journey we're going on in the next you know, 12 to 18 months. Yeah, good, good thoughts. Just a show of hands, how many of us are new in our roles? Uh, maybe, you know, they, we have a year or less at our current companies. Cool. Okay, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of us moving around. I mean, we talk about what's going on with the pandemic. It's opened up a ton of opportunities. There's, we're seeing a ton of movement in CS. And um, it's becoming quite a competitive market because any of us, for the most part, can work from anywhere. So um, lots of movement. Uh, Nadia, what about you? Please share a little bit about what you've what you've learned recently. Yeah, to be honest, I <clears throat> I had the same point as Todd. I think you know I joined uh, Thank You in March. I was in the office for three whole days actually uh, before we all um, worked from our <clears throat> uh, lovely abodes. Um, and you know, especially when you're coming into a new role, but also you know, with regards to client success, it is a very new sort of practice and not a lot of people have actually formed opinions about it or, you know, something like that. So there's a lot of, I feel like educating that you do as you come on board, especially if you are one of the first sort of leaders that join um, in customer success. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, like any change is hard, right? But especially like having to do it remotely, um, you know, it's, it, it requires conviction, it requires trust. Um, and, you know, like trying to, you know, obviously build that trust while people don't even know what your legs look like, I think is, um, is tough, right? So 
uh, definitely something that um, I, I, you know, my biggest takeaway is just like the power of sort of face to face interaction and being in a room with somebody and as you're working through change, like looking each other in the eyes and, you know, working through it together. I think that's something that I really, really missed um, in the past, in the past year. So. Mm -hmm. I love that. I just wrote that down. Building trust when no one knows your legs look like or anything below here. It's so true. I, I, you know, so many of us are new in our roles and trust, I think is going to be a theme of the community hour today. We're going to talk a lot about it. Todd, you and I talked a lot about trust um, when we were sort of doing a pre-call before this community hour. So we're definitely going to get, get into that. So um, each of you, we've mentioned you've stepped into a new role within the past 12 months. Yes, you're all seasoned customer success practitioners and leaders, um, but how did you structure your first few months, 30, 60, 90 um, in your new role? I'm curious to know what worked for you well. It's probably going to work for others who are new in their role. Um, Nadia, maybe I know you spoke last, but I'd love to, to, to uh, have you share about um have you share first here. So I just to mention, Nadia's relationship with the founders at Thankview is amazing. JD, I think I, I see you here on the call. It's so amazing that you're here to support her. And I've always noticed that that trust is strong, that relationship is strong. So I would love to hear your thoughts first on those questions. Yeah. Um, so again, I think it was just interesting sort of starting because, you know, like most people, I imagine I had, you know, like my first 90 days, like book right next to me right before I started. And I had all these great plans and I was like, okay, I'm going to go in, I'm going to observe, I'm going to, um, you know, identify what are key areas, etc. And then I feel like when the pandemic hit, it kind of just like sideswiped most of us. Um, and I felt for a good two weeks or so and, um, I felt for a good two weeks that we're kind of like suspended in midair and not really knowing like whether the momentum was going to take us up or down. So that was kind of an interesting period, I think, to start. Um, but um, when the momentum actually ended up taking us um, up, um, I think, you know, just going back to what I had originally set out, which was, okay, let's you know, again, like what Todd said as well, like talk to people, build relationship, understand what is important to the people that are working with Thank You Now, but that are that are you know our clients, um, and you know, I guess like then set the benchmarks, set like where we are now, and then where we want to go. And I think that that was what also maybe one of the key takeaways that I have is that sometimes, especially when things are kind of chaotic. Um, and you're trying to, you know, make change and you're trying to make an impact fast. Uh, sometimes you forget to set the benchmarks <laughs> so you don't potentially like know exactly where you started from. And then worse, like you don't actually know where you're heading. So you don't necessarily know what the targets are. Um, mm -hmm. I think in the past year, we've, I don't know, come up with how many partners, new partnerships and new products, JD? It's like, it's, you know, quite a, quite a few, exactly. Um, and so, you know, although I think it, it's been great, you know, coming out with those new products and really sort of pivoting, um, you know, sort of uh, based on sort of the renewed and increased um, uh, business that we saw on the thank you side, I think also just like taking a moment to be like, okay, wait, hold on a second. Like, what is our target? What do we want to uh, achieve? And then, you know, you know, after you've actually accomplished something, like going back to that and measuring like what you've actually done. Um, I think that that was probably one of the biggest lessons there for. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I was recently introduced to the golden circle. I hadn't heard of the concept before. It makes total sense, but basically at the center is the why. And then is it, you guys help me out. Is it what or how next? Uh, someone chatted, I'm sure someone knows that it's either, it's, I think it's why, what, and how. And it reminds us to always go back to, you know, when we're developing initiatives and our 30, 60, 90 plans and whatever we're trying to do, sometimes we can get really caught up in the, thank you, Andrea. <laughs> sometimes we can get really caught up in the what. I, I know I do. A lot of times I'll think of the how or what first, and then I have to go back to the why. Um, and those of, those of us in early stage, thank you, Justin. <laughs> Simon Sinek, you guys are amazing. 
um, it's important. Go back to, to that, that reason that you have. And um, a lot of times I find that if I spend too much time working on the what, by the time I remember to go to the why, the initiative actually isn't necessarily as important or crucial anymore. Things are changing so quickly. So going back to that, that piece is always, always helpful for me. Um, but we're not here to talk about me. Uh, Justin, how about you? Can you tell me a little bit about um, for you, you stepped into a relatively new role. I love that you operated as a practitioner before you started to build your team. It was so important for you to understand the ins and outs of the CSM role. Um, so yeah, I would love, love to know, did that work well for you? Would you advise other leaders do something like that as well? Just tell us your thoughts around what you learned as a part of that experience. Yeah, yeah. For for you have to remember, I'm in healthcare, so you call me a practitioner. I'm like, does she think I'm a doctor? Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm not, I was not a doctor. <laughs> my, um, my fault. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. So in, in I guess a quick background on on entering Cardiologs. So Cardiologs um, is we're a very young company. Um, so when I started, I was client services, customer success, implementation support. There was nothing. So I started from complete complete scratch. Um, so if that helps kind of frame whatever I say after this, that, that hopefully it does. Um, but my first 90 days were, was basically the plan was sponge, 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 just take everything in before I start to kind of formulate any opinions um, or, you know, take any kind of actions or push back on any, um, uh, on any kind of feedback or, or requests either internally or externally. So um, I really tried to kind of stay in the background um, and get my feet under me and really understand like, what is cardiologs? What do we value? What do our customers value? What is the, you know, short-term, long-term vision for, for the product? Um, and then, like you said, my, my plan after that was do the job, right? So I was tasked with, with uh, standing up a function, but the function needed to also just operate uh, to begin with. So it's not like I was coming in and being able to um, build something first. I had to do the job to figure out what to build off of or how to build. So um, being a sponge was, was just really what I did at first. And then once I felt comfortable, then number two was get out and meet all of our customers. Um, so that was beginning of last year. So I was, I was able to, to make my rounds before the lockdown, before the lockdown hit and, and go out and, and meet a bunch of our customers, get in front of them and start establishing those relationships um, with my feet under me. You know, I've been in healthcare for about a decade now, um, but I was new to the cardiac diagnostic space. So um, part of that sponge was actually stepping up my clinical knowledge as well so that I could be uh, somewhat competent, uh, not fall on my face when, when talking to our customers. So yeah, I, I'd say that was, that was kind of my approach was just kind of be behind the scenes and be a sponge for the first 90 days, start to understand how things, how, how things operate, um, get out, meet some customers, see how they operate, um, and then start doing the job. And then about I'd say seven months in, I started to really kind of build some formal processes, some formal points of views on things, um, which was kind of great timing because just a few months after that, um, you know, luckily we had some, we had some, we had a really good sales uh, cycle in, the, in Q1 and Q2, and I hired, uh, I hired two new members of the team. I think I see at least one here. What's going on, Evan? And mm -hmm. um, and so that was great. It was it was perfect timing to have uh, to kind of have some ideas and a processes kind of half stood up, and, and then uh, be able to kind of hand off some of those um, the, the the vision and the ideas to 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 my team to also help um, kind of build uh, what, what client services is at Cardiolog. Mm, awesome, I love that. Just a quick show of hands. Is anyone else taking this approach to where they started as a CSM before they build out the team? Just a quick. Okay. Oh, I see some. Okay, Matt. Oh, Matthew, of course. Matt. Yeah. Leanne. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did something similar at Promobox, so it definitely resonates um, with me. And then Todd, what what about you? Yeah, so 90 days, it's been a whirlwind. Um, a lot of different themes that we're talking about here, um, and I, I want to I level the playing field, right? From a, a leadership perspective and from an executive sponsor and customer success, I will never not be a practitioner. Mm. Um, you got to be out there touching the front line, understanding, be in the product, understand how it works, understand how your customers are using it. And so that's something that in the first 90 days is, 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 is a, a must have. 
Um, and then for me, right, like in the first 90 days, um, in addition to building those relationships and meeting customers, it was really about being honest with where the business was at. And at Stencil, um, we're almost $10 million, about 70 customers. And when I got to Stencil, post-sales was considered CS. And when I say post-sales, CSMs were handling onboarding implementation, activation, the commercial account management function, and yes, day-to-day -day product frontline support. And so it was an absolute, you know, every day on the floor wrestling with everything in the weeds. And so in the first 90 days, it was really important to understand it and spend a lot of time active listening to the team on where the, the pain, per, pain points were, but then also lay that foundation for the swim lanes of like, hey, who's going to do what? And so in the first mm -hmm. 90 days, we identified, you know, who is going to be responsible for onboarding implementation? Who's going to be responsible for the, the, the customer and the customer relationship? And then we recently also stood up our, our first hire in support. And what the transition that we're going through right now is like, you know, I firmly believe that, that CSMs have to get out of being the fire department, right? They are the absolute fire alarm for the business. And if your CSMs are spending all of their time in the day-to-day -day weeds, they're not focused on being proactive and, um, and, and engaging strategically. And so we had to kind of really identify those hard and fast lines and make sure that the jobs that people signed up for are the jobs that they are doing and not everything just falling post sales onto the CS plate because that's where we are. And so, you know, the first 90 days was about establishing that foundation, talking with the team, identifying the right swim lanes and making sure the people that were signed up to do the job were actually doing it. Um, and so we're still making that transition. I feel like it's like a, a battleship moving from the right-hand side slowly to the left and we're making progress. But, you know, we will never be able to get to critical mass and scale if we are stuck in the day-to-day -day weeds from a CSM perspective. And so, you know, that's, that's what the first 90 days was all about at Stencil. Smart. I definitely feel that the firefighting mentality, I think a lot of us, a lot of us are in that or have experienced that. Um, I want to call attention to um, just some of the chat around Celine's comments, Celine Kimberly. Hello, good to see you here. So actually what inspired a lot of this conversation was a conversation that Celine and I had around her first 90 days at HubSpot, where she focused on um, some really interesting tactics. Um, oh, yeah, nice. <laughs> so Celine, if that's the book you read, I would definitely recommend it for everyone here too. I'm definitely going to give it a read. Um, Okay, so uh, going back to, uh, to you guys here. So you've had some major wins over the past several months. We've talked a lot, a lot of those wins. Justin, you're adding to the team. Nadia, you've led some major churn reduction results. Todd, you're onboarding new and new customers every single day. You're about to crest over that 10 million. That's huge. I remember that at Promobox. Um, so let's put that aside for a second. I mean, celebrate every accomplishment, yes. Um, but also each of us have had our bad days. Um, and what we learn from those moments, I feel like is what turns us into okay leaders, into fantastic, amazing growing leaders. Um, so I'm curious to know when things go sideways, and it's very common that this happens. I'm going to throw this to you, Todd. <laughs> when things go sideways, we have product hiccups, we have onboarding mishaps, we have license utilization dips, we maybe didn't get the best customer for our product from the sales team, right? Do you have a go-to process um, or you know, things don't go your way? Do you have a high level strategy that you implement? implement? Any thoughts around that? Because we're always, we're always, I feel like in the crux of like, oh, I have a win, oh, I had a failure. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, it's a great question. And, and it's, it's, it's part of the cycle of the day to day, I think, in customer success, right? You have your highs and your lows, and they all happen, could happen in the same day, it could happen in the same week. Um, for me, I, I think that, you know, when I think of the lows and the way that we operate, um, for us, it's really about setting that layer of trust within the organization. The things that we see in the business today are a direct result of what we did or did not do six to nine months ago. You know, it is not what we did last week that changes the week coming forward. And so, you know, for us and, and the way that I talk with the team is like everything isn't going to be perfect. We don't have all of the answers, but we have to be honest. And, and we embrace this idea of, um, you know, people talk about um, 
push your comfort zone. And when I hear that term, push your comfort zone, right? I instantly like curl my fingers a little bit because you're asking me to do something mm -hmm. that I don't want to do. So what we've taken is, is we've adopted that terminology and we've moved it into expand our comfort zone and to take risk. And the idea there is that like, we want to fail fast and learn right? We, 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 we're not going to fix everything. We can't dive and save every customer that says, oh, I'm not going to renew. But what we can do is make sure that that transition is the smoothest possible. That anything that we can learn from that is important. And when I think of like learnings, right? Like when things don't go well, customer success sits at that very, very critical intersection between sales and product. And if, 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 if you have unhappy customers, you have customers that are waiting for product commitments, right? Our job in customer success is to be the CEO of the customer, right? We know everything that's going on. And so for me, it's about making sure that we're not just doing things in customer success in a vacuum, but we're bringing those, those wins and those learnings out to the rest of the company. Because at the end of the day, you know, companies talk about being a customer first organization. That means customer first has to be your true north. And that means in your sales team, in your marketing team, in all facets of your business, you have to have a customer lens. And so at Stencil, we, we are spending a lot of time um, bringing forward all of our learnings, the, the, the upsides and the things that are not going well. So that way we can be really transparent with the rest of the business, why we're going about it and where people can help us, right? It's not a single, uh, you know, one person, one department, you know, tretch, right? This is a team effort. And everything that we have to do has to be open and transparent, exposed to the rest of the company, because if, if, if we hold it all, right, we're never going to have enough hours in the day, we're never going to have enough people, and there's always going to be plenty of customer escalations, and we want to make sure that we're, we're, we're really kind of sharing that out with the rest of the business. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. I wrote down true north, having a true north, which I think goes to that, your why, so, so important to always be referencing back to that. Um, and then also ask for help. Two things I've learned, um, it's been a hard lesson to learn. One of them is asking for help. And then the other one is celebrating accomplishment because as we know, we have 50 plus things that we wanna accomplish every, you know, every day, every week, every quarter, whatever ever that is. And as you sort of like check off those boxes, I feel like it's so important to recognize that, celebrate it, and then quickly move on. Sometimes we move on and don't even celebrate the fact that we had a win. Um, but I, I love that. True North asking for help. That's awesome. Uh, Justin, how about, how about you? You want to share a little bit about uh, maybe a, something that didn't go exactly your way, a mishap, or what you're learning from these experiences of, you know, not, not winning and growing from, from some of the mishaps? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I didn't know when it would happen, but it, it's, it's this question where I get to say, always be gauging, right? So um, that, that, that's something that, um, and that, this is kind of uh, probably some like quick side advice too for people who are looking for new opportunities um, I came to cardiologs partly because uh, of the opportunity uh, to fail uh, and be nimble about it. So uh, I have progressively moved from smaller to smaller to smaller companies because I like the uh, I like the idea of uh, having the openness and willingness to to fail and have those experiences and then having the ability to uh, to be nimble and 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 put in you know, corrective action and change. So. Um, that certainly happened uh, at, car at Cardiologues. Um, right out of the gate, it happened. And just recently, it happened. I think um, recently, a, a, a cool kind of uh, postmortem that we had was um, based on some recent learnings, we implemented along with sales, great relationship for fostering. That's another great thing I love about Cardiologues is um, we implemented some new pricing structures for a uh, for new customer. Um, we already realized that we didn't kind of build in some ramp for these kind of performance and uh, performance based pricing. And we have already altered our next terms in, for, for our next couple prospects. So it's just, it's just great to be able to um, make these changes, have postmortems. I, I mean, I, I love, I love postmortems. We have them at our, at our quarterly leadership meetings. We have them at our annual retreats. And then we have smaller ones when little things happen. And, it, you know, there's always somebody that's quick to say postmortem on this one, postmortem on that, whatever it is. So we're always hungry to look back at what we did and not just say, oh, chalk that one up as a, as a loss, you know, move forward. Right. It's always what happened here? Where do we drop the ball? We're all confident in what we did. But um, 
something here missed the mark and let's talk about it. And so um, I, I, that's another great kind of value at, at cardiologues. I think one kind of cool way to, um, to position the fact that we, we embrace embrace failure is uh, we just spun up this kind of side project team called the fail force. And it was all with the intent of all with the intent of a group of individuals who were interested in a particular project uh, going and just giving it a shot. Right. And it was like a percentage of their, their time and fully ready to fail. And, and that's, and that's awesome. So uh, it's like, I love, I love failure. Is this like a weird thing that I'm going to say out loud? But it's it's so important to do that and, and learn and learn from it and and that's why I, that's one of the reasons why I I, I love uh, cardiologues and and kind of a a little bit of a smaller a smaller company it gives us that opportunity. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love your comment about being nimble, embracing failure, your fail force. I feel like we're going to have a lot of people that maybe launch some sort of version of their own fail force. Um, I have to say, uh, before we move to you, Nadia, Nadia, and ask you to answer the same question is, I, I did learn something from my co-founder, Jonathan. We're releasing a Give First series of how customer success leaders, Nadia was interviewed, engineering leaders, marketing leaders, um, how sales leaders, how they go about a, a Give First mentality, um, uh, give before get sort of thing. Anyways, long story short, Jonathan shared a lot about how when something goes wrong when there's a failure on the team, um, that it's never about the one engineer that maybe missed the bug that caused the issue. It's about how do we as a team address that this thing happened and then how do we make it right together? It's never any pointing fingers. Um, and I've, I've learned that from him and I've really appreciated that. Like, you know, like blaming one person is likely not going to help the overall um, tenor or culture. So Justin, I, I think that's awesome. You've embraced it. You don't call out people. You've solved it together. That's the sort of oomph that made, makes amazing companies. So well done. Um, Nadia, what about you? I know you never fail. <laughs> uh, that's, not, that's definitely not true. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think one of the things that I really strive for is innovation, right? And I, and I like to um, improve things and I like to make things better. That also means that sometimes you don't, to be honest. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I love thank you for so many, so many reasons, but, um, but I think, you know, one of the reasons also is just, you know, we have in our values, um, like, we have in our values, like honesty and respect, we have like that we own our successes and our failures. So, you know, I think that's just something that isn't great in our culture. Um, and, you know, it's something that again, like going back to what Todd has said and what Justin has said, it goes back to like, can I learn from it? Um, and can I change the outcome going forward, right? Because sometimes, sh sorry to say, as happens and there is, nothing that you can actually change going forward because maybe someone is having a bad day or something else happens that is out of your control and something that you can't really, you know, plan for going forward too. And I think it's okay. <laughs> you know, I think it's also just to be able to say to your team, like, Hey, you know, that really sucked, but you know what, we're going to get, you know, going to get past this point. And um, yeah. Um, the other thing that I guess I wanted to maybe dive into a little bit that Justin started talking about and, and Todd as well, is just sort of like the collaboration aspect um, of CS um, with sales and with other parts of the company. Um, I think it's definitely something that needs constant attention and like constant building, right? But I, I do feel that um, CS is an extremely underutilized um, aspect, to be honest, like within most organizations, um, you know, I, I think there was a lot of talk earlier about like firefighting and, you know, sort of like CS oftentimes like kind of um, sometimes I guess like making up for some gaps in the product or in the process, right? Um, but I think if you think of, um, you know, customer success really as, you know, really part of the product, um, I think you can really utilize uh, CS way more, um, mm -hmm. it, even in the sales cycle, in like new business sales cycle, to be honest. Because again, Sansa, this goes back to what you and I have talked about before. It's like, they don't just buy the product, right? It's like the whole experience that, that people opt in 
too. And, um, you know, I think it's just highlighting that aspect a little bit more uh, can really, I think like people can get more value out of that. Mm. Great. Yeah. Um, well said. Well said. Um, I also want to mention, so let's see, Chelsea in the chat. Hey, Chelsea, you, you said something that really resonated with me. Um, some small culture shifts where you said they, you have a rule, no DMs, you ask the question in public in a public space so everyone has the opportunity to learn. Such a small, subtle thing that I feel like embraces the type of culture that Nadia is talking about. Um, and then earlier, Erica at Privy, you mentioned uh, about leading versus lagging indicators in the chat and I spied it there. So we're, we're, getting, to, we're getting to that. So, the next question is around um, specifically, uh, let's see, where are we going? I lost my notes. Uh, yes, growth and retention roadblocks. So uh, obviously as this pertains to customers. So I um, wanna chat about how you all go about identifying what makes customers successful. Are there key product usage indicators? Are there key relationship indicators that drive success for you? How do you uncover those? Um, how do you identify them? Then how do you put them into practice? So I asked the question because earlier we talked about firefighting um, and firefighting when we mentioned always being in the red, always being reactive, we're really talking about focusing on those lagging indicators. Sometimes we don't focus on our leading indicators because maybe we don't know them. I know everyone that I'm chatting with today, Todd, Justin, Nadia, you've done a lot of work around leading indicators and what are the key um, pieces to success with, with your group, with your customer. So um, I would love to know a little bit more, uh, Todd, maybe we'll, we'll flip it to you. So um, how have you identified or uncovered in the past? What makes your customers successful? And then how do you replicate that across us other customer segments? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's certainly top of mind and, and, and very much um, the focus of what we're doing right now and what we need to deliver in Q4 to be really clear with this group, and I want to be honest and transparent at Stencil, right? We are flying completely blind. Um, you know, part of the, the first seven months was being honest with the organization as to where we were in harvesting our data. And of course, the board wants to know, like, where's our customer health score? Where's NPS? Where are all of these CSAT scores? And like, we simply don't have that data. And so we're doing some manual ad hoc things to harvest that today. Um, what I would caution this group is, is as you get that motion of collecting data underway, know that like you need statistically relevant populations of data set. Like when I got to the stencil, we launched an ad hoc NPS program and we've collected it twice, a Q2 and Q3. It threw off all sorts of um, uh, false negatives in that things that were going on. And then we started to look at the data set. We sliced it and diced it a hundred different ways. And the answer was there was nothing really actionable out of that data. There were some like fire alarm moments. And then there were some other things that were like, ah, well. And so what we're, what we're in the process of doing is making sure that we can harvest that data and really use data to drive our actions. But absence of that, we're using a subjective kind of health score. And it really leaves me feeling uncomfortable because it's like a, a red, yellow, green from the CSM inputting it into Salesforce on a monthly basis. And as we all know, right, like that, that red, yellow, green probably changes three or four times in any given day, more or less a moment in time when you record it in Salesforce at some point in the month. So for us, it's, it's, it's really about making sure that we're honest with um, where we are in collecting data, what our path forward is. We're gonna automate MPS, we're having product outreaches and gonna stand up our cab. Um, we're also doing loss review to really kind of make sure that we think about why we lost customers. And you know, listen, customer success for Stencil, and I think for a lot of us, is about creating predictability in the business. And predictability for me doesn't mean that they're going to renew, but it means that if they don't meet the ICP or they were not a good fit for our customer profile, it gives us some leading indication as to where do we wanna hedge our bets on the resources to make our customers really successful. And if we've got some outlying situation with a, a legacy deal or one of those lopsided sales deals that comes across the finish line, like identify who they are for what they are early on and then figure out how do you wanna make them successful or are you not going to? Um, there's nothing worse than devoting a ton of resources to a customer that shows up dead at the end of that process. 
And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I talk to a lot of customer success leaders and practitioners and like, there is not one Holy grail KPI, uh, you know, just like Justin said, like it depends, but I've been in roles in other companies where we've had well-oiled machines and we're harvesting customer health scores. And guess what? The green customers show up dead too. Not a lot of them, mm. but there are reasons that green customers show up dead. It could be your engagement model. It could be product feature set. It could be competitive price. And those are areas that we all want to be working towards. But I would be lying to this group if I said that there was one leading indicator or one trailing indicator that says this customer is going to renew or they're going to grow because you've got to be constantly touching and looking at the data and having your, your finger on the pulse and know that there are outliers to all of the, the different like KPIs that you may be harvesting. Mm-mm, powerful. Yeah, I, there is no one ring to rule them all. You I know, wish there was, right? Like it would be amazing, <laughs> right? Like, okay, they're green or, or they're silver or diamond and, and they're, they're never going to go anywhere, but that's just not the real case. Yeah, yeah. Uh, health, customer health scoring and identifying these key pieces, it's not easy. I mean, I, I feel like everyone could raise their hand, but like how many of us are struggling on leading versus lagging and trying to truly understand what's leading? I mean, and, you know, I know we, we, we're constantly going through that exercise. Um, Awesome. All right. Let's, uh, Nadia, let's, let's go to you. Actually, can you talk to us a little bit about how you have done the hard work? I mean, I know when we started working together, I love this about Nadia, JD, another plug, Kevin, I mean, you already are experiencing this with Nadia, but like she came to the table and she was like, here are the things that I know customers have to do. Um, here's what I don't understand. Here's what I do understand. So I'm curious to know, um, as you've developed those leading indicators, that recipe for success, I guess, how did you do that? How are you evolving that over time? I mean, again, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just a small question. Just, yeah. Well, thanks. Um, I think we're only just starting. Right. And, and, and like Todd was saying earlier, um, I think, you know, we, we were flying blind for a long time and I'm not saying that we are, you know, seeing things clearly now, I think we're seeing more uh, at this point, um, obviously with some help with Koala, thank you. Um, (laughs) But, um, you know, like we have over a thousand clients and that's a lot to go through if you're trying to analyze if they're doing well or if they're not doing well, right? You don't, um, we only just built out that we grew the team from, um, you know, actually funny as you're talking, Todd, there's so much so much that I hear that you're saying that we actually did a thank you as well. So we actually started with five customer success managers who were doing onboarding, they were doing support, they were also responsible for renewals and for upsells. And then we actually now have three teams. We have a dedicated support team, we have a dedicated onboarding team, and then we have actually client success. Um, So yeah, so actually now having a team that can focus on our clients proactively to be honest, we're still kind of in reactive mode. We're trying to get to proactive, but we're at this point in time still somewhat in reactive mode. Um, and I, you know, like I think going back to what you said with regards to like identifying, um, you know, what is a healthy customer. I think it comes down to, I mean, it comes down to value perception, right? Mm. And here's the tricky part. Value perception is different (laughs) depending on the product that you're selling and the customer that you're selling to. So um, it it, it is quite a personal sort of thing that you have to um, sort of identify with your team and with your clients with regards to how you measure that. I know that's probably not super helpful, but, um, you know, it's very helpful. It it comes down to, you know, not just... um, not just the utilization part, like, are they using the product? Cause we've had, you know, like what Todd said, like we've had green customers that have been using the platform a lot. And then they, and they even love us, you know, like, and it said like, we really love you guys. Sorry, we won't be renewing this year. And we're like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, so it's just mm-hmm. identifying like from those stories, like, okay. So then if we hit like these nine points, what was that one point that then actually pushed them over the, you know, mm. like not to renew. So I think mm. you always have to just keep being curious about why customers are staying and why they're leaving um, and mm-hmm. keep adjusting like your, um, keep adjusting like what you measure value perception with. 
Yeah, I'm hearing a lot of themes here. You know, keep uh, always be gauging. It depends. You know, get curious. All important things. Um, yeah, uh, Justin, what what about you? Talk to us a little bit about how you understand uh, the activities of your most successful customers or your journey along that. Yeah, I mean, so many things. Like Nadia and Todd got like the 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 gear is really moving. I want to like mention like a little bit from everything they've said, but. Um, you know, we had a similar, um, we, so we're, we're considered a medical device. Uh, so we actually by regulatory standards have to have an MPS, have to have a survey score, um, implemented of some sort. It, it's just, a, it's a legality. So we implemented one and scores were off the charts. And so um, I was like temper expectations to everybody because a lot of people in the, at the company were not familiar with with like NPS and stuff. Um, and so we kind of had an opposite effect, which is, which is everybody's like, oh, this is the best, this is the best. And I was like, this is one indicator. This is, you know, one input into the health or the, you know, or the, or the uh, satisfaction or loyalty of a customer. Um, and we've seen them come down since we've signed more customers. And it's like, yeah, you're bound to have, you know, you're bound to have some, um, some degradation from that. Um, but I think like the main kind of thing I'll probably put out there um, because Nadia and Todd said all of the, all of the things already, which is great um, uh, that I would have said is you put a plan in place, right? You have all of your inputs like your NPS and maybe your comments from the NPS and, uh, and, you know, some data driven insights into, um, you know, customer ac activity and what that's telling you. And you come out of that with somewhat of a decision tree or an idea for, you know, how can we now get proactive or, or in a sense, reactive to these, to these trends. Um, the thing that I'm, the thing that I'm liking, uh, I like to see, and, you know, I'll bump Koala on this is, is the qualitative, you know, the nature of things and trusting your team. So um, what I'm trying to embrace is, you know, I've hired some, some great CSMs, uh, I trust them. So I think what we will do is with each of our books of business uh, and we're kind of in the throes of what we're calling performance coaching right now, which is a growth initiative, is here's all of the things that the numbers are telling us, all the inputs, the NPS, the activities, the user performance. Um, here's what those things, here's what the calls to action could be for those. Why does this call to action apply to your customer? And why does this call to action apply to your customer or not, or vice versa? And so I'm trusting the relationships that I've built with my customers and that my CSMs have built with their customers and their book of business to apply the right lens uh, or, to, mm -hmm. or to use their lens and apply the right call to action. So I think, uh, yeah, my kind of takeaway from this um, would be come up with a basic plan, a basic strategy, give your, your team and your company options for how to attack that and then make the decisions based on those customer to customer relationships. Um, it's probably easy for, for us to say that at Cardiologs because I think mm -hmm. Nadia, you said you had a thousand customers or something. We don't have a thousand customers. I won't say how many we have. Uh, we're, we're doing great, but we're just so young. And, and so we are right now um, are lucky to have the ability to stay really, um, you know, really high touch with all of our customers. So um, you know, my anxiety will, will change and my answers will change as we start to uh, have to move to a lower, a lower touch model. But, uh, but for now, that's what we're doing. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That um, I definitely noticed that, you know, working with you guys day in and, and day out, um, you mentioned trust again, you put a lot of trust in your team and uh, you are constantly looking at what the data comes back with and trying to build a group of CSMs that you know, have that really core inner compass that can understand from a relationship perspective and also a data perspective, what equals customer health. And I absolutely love that, definitely resonates. Um, okay, we have a few minutes left. So I'm gonna, this will be our, our last question for today. And guys, feel free if there were questions that you had that we didn't answer, or if there are questions that you felt like um, 
uh, you want to dig into or topics you want to dig into, go ahead and chat those. Feel free to email us after as well. Um, we take all of the things that we see in the chat and we use that for fodder for future community hours. Um, I think our next one is going to be about CS at scale, just a plug if any of you are interested in that topic. Um, got that from our friends Erica, Privy, and Jackie. Um, Anyways, I digress. So let's get to the last question and then I'll just leave it open. You guys can answer as you as you feel inspired to. So it's about customer centric cultures. And I know that a lot of us sometimes pay a little bit of lip service to this. Um, it's, a, it's a buzzword thing. It's sort of like, we all wanna be innovative, right? We all wanna be customer centric. Um, and I feel like you, you all are actually working at customer centric organizations. So I'm curious to know, how has that culture developed and what is the CS um, role in helping to push forward the idea of a customer centric culture? How does it manifest with your company? So again, you know, we don't ask any easy questions here at community hours. We're always like Ooh, into the deep end. So feel free, you know, Easter egg, uh, not Easter egg style, um, just whoever wants to go first to tell us a little bit about how that culture has been evolving at your company and maybe any, any, tips or thoughts you have around CS's role in that? I'll go. Um, so I, I think that one thing that uh, makes us customer, customer centric makes it sound, right? When people say that, it makes it sound like we need to have these awesome relationships with our customers, these deep, you know, uh, social relationships, and we hug them when we see them and they love to see us. And I don't really think that that's what customer centric means to me anyways, right? Customer centric means like listening to what they're telling you either literally or figuratively um, and, and respecting that and reacting to that. So like one example from uh, for us is uh, we, we definitely need to have some type of cadence or touch points, right? With our, with our customers or something predictable or whatever. But uh, you know, some of our customers just want to be left alone and they're, you know, and unless they are in, you know, unless they are looking like they're going to churn or, or, you know, they're, they're, or they're performing terribly or something like that. Like generally we're going to more or less listen to that vibe. Um, we haven't had anyone literally tell us to leave them alone, which is, which is nice, but you know, uh, there's no need to, you know, to, to, to throw a weekly, a weekly meeting on the books and a quarterly governance review and, mm -hmm. you know, email them twice a week to check in. If that's not the type of customer that they are, if that's not the type of relationship that they're trying to foster with you, you shouldn't try to, right. So uh, maybe mirroring is a, is a tactic that people might use here with that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, try to, um, you know, we try to um, respect the vibe that we get. So we have customers. Uh, I think we have, we have very few customers that are on the same kind of cadence uh, as any as any other ones. I mean, we have we have some customers we talk to quarterly, monthly, weekly, biweekly, not even quarterly, right? And and so we're interacting interacting with them through like support cases and things of that nature. But as far as just like faking a relationship, uh, right, to to, to make ourselves mm -hmm. as a company feel better. Uh, we don't need to do that, right? So we have we have some customers. They'll, they'll let us know how they feel through our MPS surveys, and they'll maybe throw a comment in there that we can we can react to. And we don't talk to them a lot, but thanks for that comment. And we'll reach out, and everything's mm -hmm. great. And they they appreciated that, and then we we let them be. And and so um, that's that's how I kind of see customer centric as not necessarily meaning you got to be best friends with every customer and yell it from the mountaintops. Um, and you know, you, you actually want to respect what they want from the relationship, not just what you think is best. I like that. Listen, to sort of boil it down to your point about listening and responding. It sounds like there are simple ways. We don't have to make it super complicated. Um, customer centricity can be really easy for us to implement on a day-to-day -day basis, but just those two different things, listening and responding. That's awesome. Okay, we have three minutes. Todd, Nadia, any uh, any good nuggets to share here? I I just want to maybe just share like a small thing um, that I that I've noticed and and that I actually need to do more with, to be honest. Um, so you know, the thank you team is still here. We'll be doing more with this. Um, but something that I noticed, like as we were going through like building processes, org structures, corporate goals, etc., that are um, you know more customer centric. 
um, I think in the end though, what it comes down to is actually like where I've seen the true manifestation of actual like customer centric culture is where every employee feels empowered to, um, to care about a customer mm. and feels empowered to take action on that. Um, and so that. that can, you know, express itself in like, you know, a support employee that, you know, just kind of like goes above and like says, Hey, you know what you can, I don't know, like, even if it's like this, this feature or whatever, like that typically like costs money, you know, what we're going to do that for free, because we just want to make sure that you're, you know, you can succeed in what you're trying to succeed with right now. Um, or, you know, a, a, I don't know, a client success person, um, you know, working uh, with a special discount value and, and not having to go to, you know, their manager, having to go to wherever and feeling like, hey, if I can make this customer happy right now, I feel like the company will support me in this action. And I think, you know, I know it's kind of, I don't know, simple, but um, I like it. That, that really brings home that customer centric culture. I like it. Todd, Todd, sorry to give you know, a few few seconds. Go ahead. A couple seconds. The, the, the things that I would share on the, on customer centricity for Stencil, right, is we're in the process of standing up our own internal customer reviews, and we invite everyone to come participate. We set out an agenda that lists what customers we're going to talk through at what time periods, and then anyone and everyone can come hear what our plan is for that particular customer. And we do a little bit of the SWOT analysis. We do a little bit of look at like where the engagement is with that customer. And we share out all of the information and what we're looking to do. So that way, when there are roadblocks or customer requests for feature enhancements, it's not like it came from left field. It's not like this is the first time we're talking about it. Um, again, our job is to, to minimize surprises in the business and create predictability. And that, that motion of sharing uber transparency between support cases, configuration utilization, NPS score, CSAT is a company wide thing. And so we have Slack channels that share that across the board. And so the more information we can share out with the organization, the more we can bring them along in our journey for creating success with our customers. Amazing. That is the perfect way to end. Thank you so much. It was so good to see all of your faces. Thank you to Nadia, Justin, Todd. Thank you for joining with us, leading, and uh, to all the amazing questions. So have a fantastic rest of your Tuesday, a rest of your week, and we'll see you later.